church and our online family and friends. We serve a mighty God. Thank you so much for joining us on this Bible study night. We pray that you will share this video with your family and friends. Our scripture comes from Psalm 50 verses 1 through 6. Psalm 50 verses 1 through 6. And it reads, the Lord, the mighty one, is God, and he has spoken. He has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets. From Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines in glorious radiance. Our God approaches, and he is not silent. Fire devours everything in his way and a great storm rages around him. He calls on the heavens above and earth below to witness the judgment of his people. Bring my faithful people to me, those who made a covenant with me by giving sacrifices. Then let the heavens proclaim his justice, for God himself will be the judge. Verse 1 says, the Lord, the mighty one, is God, and he has spoken. We serve the mighty God. Dolores Sadler, in her devotion this morning, talked about bad news. Everywhere you turn, there is bad news. Bad news in the newspaper. Bad news on the radio. Bad news on the TV. Bad news in live streaming and even bad news on Facebook. But for those of us who serve the risen Savior, we have hope, we have peace, and we have joy because we serve the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the almighty God. So Satan, I command you in the name of the Lord, to take up your weapons and flee. For the Lord has given me, the Lord has given us authority over you to walk all over you. Our song for today, What a Mighty God We Serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. We thank you, Father God, for your word. We thank you, Father God, for being the mighty God. We thank you, Lord, for trusting us with your word on tonight. We ask you, Father God, to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives, Father God, that our lives will reflect Christ and Christ alone. Lord, we ask you to bless us, Father God, as we dive into your word one more time. Speak to us tonight, Father God. Give us your promise, Father God, and bless us to believe you by faith. 
It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. What a mighty God we serve. He is a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth. Heaven the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us in our song service on tonight, and please continue to join us tonight as we walk through the Word of God. Amen. We are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're dealing with that last pericope in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The pericope starts in verse 13, so on last week we covered verses 13, 14, and 15. On tonight, we look to cover verses 16, 17, and 18. We had to split the pericope up because God has a lot to say in these few verses. God has a lot to say, and he's saying it to us even in the 21st century. He is speaking. He is speaking to us. He is acknowledging us, and we ought to acknowledge him. Amen? He is admonishing us to do the right thing and to follow him. This passage, this pericope, is packed with divine truths. First Thessalonians in the New Testament, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 18 is where we are tonight. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 18. We've covered this entire chapter up to this point, and the Apostle Paul is telling us in the first pericope verses 1 through 8, he says to us, he pleads with us to walk in purity. He talks to us about staying out of the way and staying away from our passions and our lusts and our sexual sin. Then he moves to the second pericope where he deals with brotherly love. He tells us to love each other. And not only does he tell us to love each other, he tells us to love outside. He tells us to make sure we love and show love toward outsiders. So we are not given a bigoted attitude through Christ. Christ wants us to be on the same level as everybody else, but we must admonish God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, admonish him as the Savior of our lives, the Savior of our soul, and admonish him as our Lord and Savior. So we not only need to uh, love each other, we need to love those who are still struggling, those who have not acknowledged Jesus Christ as their Savior. And he ends that pericope in verse number 12. He ends that pericope by saying that you may lack nothing. Love will get you what you need. He says, love people so you will lack nothing. So last week, we dealt with the first portion of this final pericope <clears throat> where the Apostle Paul issues a promise to us. He issues a promise to us that Jesus Christ is coming back. Let me tell you, that's good news. Mm -hmm. It's good news to know that our Savior, our Lord, has not abandoned us. Amen. Sister Davis and... and and, and Sister Sattler de dealt today with the fact that uh, there's bad news everywhere. I want to offer you good news tonight. And the good news tonight, and we want to be confident by this news, the good news tonight is that Jesus is coming back. The same Jesus that left here in a cloud is coming back in a cloud. He's not coming in a Rolls Royce. He's not coming in a limousine. He's not coming in a Mercedes, a BMW, a Lexus. He's not coming in a Ford. He's not coming in a Kia. He is coming on a cloud. Yes. That's why we know that none of the men who have claimed to be Christ, none of the men who have claimed to be the Messiah, none of them is Christ because the same Christ that left here on a cloud, he's coming back on a cloud. The Bible teaches that even Christ doesn't know when he's coming back. He's going to stop in midair. And that's what we pick up 
on tonight in this particular pericope, Paul begins by saying in verse number 13, he says, I don't want you to be ill informed. I don't want you to be uninformed. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning people in your family and your loved ones who have fallen asleep. This word sleep is used as a metaphor for death. So Jesus uh, oftentimes used the word sleep. He said, Lazarus is not dead, but he is asleep. He said, the girl, Jairus' daughter, is not dead, she is asleep. In other words, this word sleep is an interchangeable word for death. I mean, all the way dead. So he says, don't be concerned about those who have fallen into death. And don't sorrow and don't get all upset as if you have no hope, like many others have no hope. You see, when a loved one who dies in Jesus Christ, a loved one who is a Christian who dies in Christ, that loved one has a hope of being resurrected. Not only does that loved one have hope, we who are loved one who are left have hope in them being resurrected. Not only that, once we die, we have hope of being resurrected. And if we're still here, as we close out this pericope, we're going to find out tonight or be reassured tonight, if we're still walking around when Jesus cracks the sky, what's going to happen is we're going to be caught up. The word rapture comes from the word rapturo. This word rapturo, uh, it means to be caught up. So with the word rapture means to be caught up. And what Jesus is going to do, he's going to come in the church of Jesus Christ will be caught up in midair. We're going to be caught up. We're going to be snatched. This word rapture is a great snatching away. This word rapture means that there will be Christian airplane pilots flying the plane. And all of a sudden, they're out of here. And the plane goes down in a nosedive. Wow. There will be engineers who are engineering a train. And the train will not have any engineer to put on the brakes if the engineer is a Christian when Jesus cracked the sky. Mm -hmm. Look at what it says. It says, so therefore, those people who are left will go down in the crash. It's not necessarily that they would die in the crash. But the fact is, Jesus is coming back again, and he's going to take away every Christian, mm -hmm. every born-again believer. He says... Don't sorrow. Don't get so upset. Don't get so demolished and so down because your loved ones who have died in Christ have gone on to be with the Lord. Let me just share with you. There's good news tonight. Right. He says, don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Then he moves to verse 14 and says, for we who believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, Will God bring with him those who are asleep in Christ? So those who, who died in Christ, those who are asleep in Christ, God will bring them with him. And we're concerned about the, the fact that they're dead. And we've come to the conclusion that when men are dead, they are done. But let me just share with you, God is still operating even when folk are dead. God is still on this throne even when we can't see him. Yes. God is still moving even when we can't track him. Yes. Verse 15 says, For this I say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Paul gives us another promise. He gives us another assurance. And this assurance is those who have died in Christ, when Jesus cracked the sky at the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise first. He says, stop moaning, stop groaning, stop complaining, stop sorrowing as if you have no hope because you have hope. Even though those people are gone on and have died, 
When Jesus cracked the sky, he'll bring them with him. I explained to you on last week, the body goes back to the earth. Jesus will bring their spirit back, back with him. And when he brings the spirit back with him, the body meets the spirit in midair. Wow. Somebody is wondering tonight, well, if my loved one was, was, was um, what do you call that, was uh, cremated, if my loved one was cremated, then how is God going to take the body and the spirit and bring it back together? My loved one ashes was sprinkled throughout the ocean. Somebody is asking the question, how is God going to find all those pieces? Mm. Somebody is asking the question, if my loved one went off to war and he came back or she came back with some limbs missing, how is God going to put the limbs back together again? Well, let me tell you now, let me remind you, you talking about a God who stepped mm -hmm. out on nothing That's in the middle of nowhere and saw the darkness and the darkness was deep. The darkness was darker than even in the country. Jesus, God himself, stepped out on nothing and called light into existence. God, who stooped down in the dust, not even good dirt, and created a man. The God who took a man's rib and created a whole woman. And you ask the question, how is God going to put a body back together? This is God we're talking about. God can do anything. I'm just so excited. And, and sometimes, and even in Bible study, I get a little excited about what God is doing simply because man only see God as they see man. But we have to get to a point where we see God as God and man as man. And God can do anything. He can put it, he can put it together even if it never existed. You see, man can only take what God has already put together and try to shape it and form it. Matter of fact, scientists will tell you today that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. But energy can only be transformed or, or moved from one dimension to the other. Energy can only be turned in one way or the other. It can, there's no more energy to be made. <laughs> we find an animals and we think we naming animals. Adam named those Adam animals years ago because God put everything here that is here. And we think that these things are news to God. Yes, the God we serve is an awesome God. Yes, he is the awesome God. Verse 15 says, for this I say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, the apostle Paul talks about we who are alive as if he believed that Jesus would come back during his time. And you know what? The seasoned saints back home always talked about Jesus is coming soon because they didn't know, as the apostle Paul didn't know, when Jesus would crack the sky. Mm -hmm. So when we speak, when we talk about it, we must talk about it as if he will come in our lifetime. Right here, as I'm teaching this lesson, he could come back. Everything is in place. Everything is set for us to be snatched out of here right now. None of us know when. We just have to be ready. The songwriter says it like this. I pray we all be ready. I pray we all be ready when Jesus comes. For the Lord says to you, by the, I say to you, by the word of the Lord, that those of us who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. Paul is dealing with the fact that there are dead folk who love the Lord. There are dead folk who are saved. There are dead folk who believe the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and they believed it and trusted it to get them to heaven. The Bible says that we will not perceive those who are already dead. If you read the King James Version, that word, it says that we should, we should it doesn't say we should not perceive. It says we should not prevent. 
But when you take that word prevent and look at it in the original Greek text, because it doesn't make any sense. You got to, you have to look at it in the Greek text. And when you look at it in the original Greek text, this word prevent means proceed which means go before. So it says that those of us who are alive and well and walking around here, we will not go before. We will not proceed. We will not prevent those who have already died. So what I'm saying to you today, my dears, is that when you use the word prevent and you read it straight from King James, you have to make sure that you do your word study because we have no control <laughs> over what will happen to the dead. We have no control of what will happen in the resurrection. But the text declares, when you look at the word prevent, you have to look at it from a, a spiritual standpoint, and we will not perceive them. In other words, dead folk will rise first. Right. They will rise first. We will no wise and no wise perceive them. So don't sorrow. Don't get upset. Don't, don't, don't get so bent out of shape that you can't function. Sometimes people die. Other folk just can't function anymore. I mean, they 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 just clown in funerals. They said, "I let me in there, let me in there." The first time uh, somebody says that in a funeral that I'm officiating, I'm gonna call the undertaker up and say, uh, "Exchange the bodies out." <laughs> if they want to get in there and put them in there, and then there are others who who just say anything and act any kind of way. It ought not been that person. It should have been me. <laughs> well, God is wise. God knows who to take, and God knows when to take them. So we won't precede them. We won't go before them. We won't rise before them. So look at the picture. The dead people who died in Christ will rise first. It will be just a moment before those of us who are alive will rise also. The dead will rise out of the grave. But those of us who were alive will rise from the earth. And the Bible says we will forever be with the Lord. Let's look at it. Verse number 16. Verse number 16, it says to us that we need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we want to go before them. So verse 16 says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 16 says, at the shout, at the voice, and at the trumpet, Jesus going to crack the sky. It says, the Lord himself will descend. You see, heaven is high. Heaven is above. And because heaven is above, then the same Jesus that ascended to heaven is the same Jesus that will descend to earth. Mm -hmm. And this particular pericope, this particular text, he will not come all the way to earth. The Bible says, and it's very clearly stated here, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17, then we who are alive, we who remain, we who are alive on planet earth, we who remain on planet earth shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Can you picture this? The dead in Christ will rise first. Just a moment afterward, those who are alive and those who remain walking, talking, lying in planet Earth, they will rise. So the point here is we will be with the Lord. The dead in Christ will rise first. They will be with the Lord. Then momentarily, uh, there's a moment, just a moment, 
just a moment of time difference. Then in a moment, we will, we who walk around, and I have to say we, as Paul said, we, because we don't know when. Yes. We don't know where we're going to be. We don't know how we're going to act, how we're going to be acting. Yes. Don't let God come back with your work undone. Mm. When you're saved, when you're born again, you can be assured that this verse is talking to you. Verse 17 says, if we remain, if we are alive, if we're walking on planet earth, we will be snatched away. We will be caught up together. We will be raptured together. Now, whatever you do, do not get the advent confused with Jesus coming back to get the church. Do not get Jesus coming all the way to all the way to earth to start his millennial reign confused with this passage. In this passage, it's talking about the church itself. The church itself, the born again believers will be snatched away, will be caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We will forever be with the Lord. Look at what it says. It says, and, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Who will be with the Lord? First of all, you will have those who died in Christ. They're going to be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Secondly, those who remain, those who are alive, when they get caught up, they will forever be with the Lord. Now picture this. Now you got those who've already died before us and those of us who remain, We both, both groups will be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they will be with the Lord from now on. Mm -hmm. That's good news to me. That is good news. We will forever be with the Lord. We will be with the Lord from now on. We will be, the, be with the Lord until. We will be with the Lord in eternity. See the picture. Jesus Christ, who ascended to heaven, from earth to heaven, the same Jesus Christ who ascended to heaven, that same Jesus Christ who got up and went up to heaven, the same Jesus Christ that got on a cloud and left the disciples standing around gazing, that same Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father right now. He says in John 14, I am going away to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you will be also. In my father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you it wasn't so. So what Jesus is doing right now is interceding for us and preparing a mansion for us. Now, you have, you have to understand, you have to understand that when God talks about a mansion, when Jesus talks about a mansion, he's talking about one big house with several rooms. And, and because in those days, the children stayed with the parents and they stayed with the parents in one big house. Jesus is going to prepare a mansion for us a room for us. And you can't compare that mansion to your house on earth. You cannot compare the mansion that God is talking about to the mansion that we will have on the other side. You cannot compare it to what you walk around in every day. Because the fact is the homeless man who knows Jesus Christ and realizes that his death, burial, and resurrection will get him to heaven. The homeless man who has a box he lives in, and every time the wind blows, his address changes because that box is moved. The same homeless man that has, has drug out a mattress and put it under the bridge, that same homeless man is going to be in the mansion. If he believed the story and trust that story to get him to heaven. Mm -hmm. Let me just share with you today. Those of us who think we live in a mansion now does not compare. You can't even imagine what God's mansion is about. You can't imagine what it looks like. 
You cannot imagine where we're going when we leave planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Right now, Jesus is setting up things for us. Yes. Not only is he setting up things for us, the Bible says he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. He's making intercessions for us. Yes. You confess your sin, Jesus turned to God and said, forgive him again. You mess up and you confess your sins, Jesus says, God, I died for him. You mess up and you keep messing up, Jesus keep turning to God. As you confess your sins, you repent of your sins, you turn away from your sins, you change your mind towards your sins, Jesus is making intercession for you. The same Jesus that left here on the cloud is sitting on the right hand of the Father, interceding for you. He's pleading your case. He is our defense attorney. He is our lawyer. He is our advocate. Mm -hmm. You just have to confess your sin. He's making your pleas known before God. Yes. He's actually pleading your case. He has taken our place already. Yes. I don't suppose to be raising my voice in Bible study, but I get excited about what Jesus has done and what he is doing right yes. now. Yes. So, he, so he says, he says that that we will be caught up together. This word together means that the dead folk who are already dead and the live folk who are still living, we're going to be caught up together. We're going to be gathered together and to ever be with, forever be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. We're going to be with him forever. Final verse, verse number 18. He says, comfort one another. New King James says it like this. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This pericope tonight, this passage of scripture tonight, ought to be comforting to you. It ought to offer you comfort. First of all, in verse 13 through 18, you ought to be comforted to know that you don't have to be sad and sorrowful as if you have no hope. Yes, you don't have to be so distraught that you just give up and give out. Somebody who's considering suicide, you don't have to go that route. Trust Jesus. Yes. Trust God. Trust the Holy Spirit. He says, he says, if I don't want you to be ignorant concerning your loved ones have fallen asleep, you don't have to be sorrowful. Yes. You do have hope. The word of God offers us hope. You do have hope. Stop saying you don't have hope. Stop saying you're hopeless. It doesn't matter what Congress does. It doesn't matter what the president does or does not do. It doesn't matter who's the vice president. What matters is we got hope in Jesus. Amen. We hope in him. We have hope. Hope is faith standing on his tiptoes, trying to see what God is sending over the horizon. You got hope, baby. You got hope, brother. You got hope, sister. You got hope. You got hope in Jesus. And the only way you can have hope, Paul says, is that you believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again. He picks this thought up again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 52 through 58. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Mm -hmm. This mortal will put on immortality. This corrupt will put on incorruption. And he says here, we will forever be with the Lord. He says, don't get all shaken. You, there's hope. And not only does he, he gives us the promise that that hope is available and hope is alive and that you ought to have hope. He also give us the promise that if you believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, those who are still alive will not go before those who are asleep. But we're going. That's why I always say, uh, on my way to the rapture, it doesn't matter if I'm alive or dead, I'm on my way to the rapture. We're going to be caught up one day. And we're going to be caught up before the tribulation begins. This stuff we got going on now, I hear news reporters say apocalyptic 
and they try to describe all the horrors that's taking place today. And they use the word apostolic. It has nothing to do with it. We haven't even come close. We haven't even come close to how bad it's going to get. It's going to get worse. We are nowhere near it. Dr. Tony Evans describes this, this rapture, this catching away, this snatching away, this, this being caught up. He describes it as, as when, a, when a president declares war on another nation. He, he, he tells the nation and he tells the people in that other nation and he tells the people in this nation, I'm, go I'm going to declare war. Then when he declares war, he says, I declare war in 72 hours, we're going to bomb the place. And the reason why he gives a timeline is because he is letting those U.S. citizens in other countries that he's, going, he's declaring war on, he's warning them, he's telling them, y'all better come on home. He, he's telling them that, that I'm going to bomb the place in a few hours. I'm telling you now, get your visa out, get your passport out, and come on home. Because I'm getting ready to bomb the place. And the moment that 72-hour period hits, when, there, when 72 hours have passed, bombs start blowing up. And, and guess what? Those U.S. citizens who did not prepare are bombed also. The good news about that is one of these days, God has been warning us. He, he's been telling us throughout the Bible, Noah built a boat. They laughed at it. God's warning us. Moses warning us. David warning us through the kings and the prophets. God is warning us. Get your house in order. Get right with the Lord. I'm going to bomb the place. So what God does in, here, in this text, when the rapture, the, ca the, the catching up and the snatching away takes place, what God does, he calls all the U.S. citizens home. So what he does is he tells us, I'm going to bomb the place. God is telling us he's going to bomb the place. Just like the president calls the U.S. citizens home, God is going to rapture up and call all the heavenly citizens home. That's why the old preacher used to say, this is not my home. Right. I'm just a stranger. I'm just a pilgrim passing through. Mm -hmm. God is going to pull us out of here. Yes, he and after he pulls us out of here, then the tribulation takes place. We think that people are killing people now. We yeah. think it's awful. We think diseases are, are running rapid and we, we know it's awful. We, we think that, that people have no heart and we think that people are confused about who they are. That is nothing compared to what's going to happen. When Jesus snatches the church out of here, when God calls the church home, the tribulation begins and Jesus comes. He, after he snatches us out of here, Jesus comes and the tribulation begins. Jesus ruled this world for a thousand years. Then the tribulation takes place. And guess what happened? Stuff takes place that we couldn't even, even dream of. In Revelation chapter 9, it says that men will want to die, and they cannot die. Men will jump off a tall building, hit the ground, brains shattered, bones shattered everywhere, and they get right back up and keep living. Mm -hmm. The Bible says men will have a desire to die, but God won't let them die. Right. They're going to have to go through the tribulation. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to do that tonight. You do not have to go through it. The Bible says, comfort one another with these words. You don't have to go through it. You can be caught up. You can be raptured out of here. You can be taken out of here. But you must be. You have to be. You got to be born again. Yes. Right here in the text, it says in verse 14, it says that you must believe that Jesus died and rose again. You don't have to do any extraordinary thing, but just trust the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and trust that story to get you to heaven. Amen. Your good works won't get you there. Regardless of how many people you feed, if you're not saved, you're going to hell. Yeah, that's right. 
Regardless of how many kind words and encouraging words you say to people, if you're not born again, you're going to hell. You need to trust this story. What story? The story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And if you want to go to heaven when you die, when you die, I plead with you today. Join me in this simple prayer. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Believe that he died for your sins and believe that he rose from the dead. We need a revival. We need a conversion. We need a, a transformation to take place. You can be a part of that if you just trust Jesus Christ as your personal savior. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. The door is open. I say to you, join me in prayer. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Just believe this story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. Just believe this story that mean men killed him on a hill. Mean men nailed Jesus to the cross. He actually died on that cross. To verify his death, they stuck a spear in his side. Out came blood and water, and that blood is what saves us. That blood is what keeps us. If you're not saved tonight, you need to be saved. You need to believe the story that Jesus died on a hill. They killed him on the cross. They took the cross down. Took Jesus off the cross. Joseph volunteered his tomb. They laid Jesus in a tomb. They laid him in a grave. He was dead. He was all the way dead. You got to believe the story. That he died on the cross. They took him off the cross. They laid him in a tomb. They laid him in the grave. After they laid him in the grave, he promised that in three days he would rise again. He stayed in the grave. But early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. This is your moment. If you can believe that simple story, your works can't get you to heaven, but this story can. If you can believe that Jesus died for your sins and buried in a borrowed tomb and rose from the dead, you can be saved right now, right here. Regardless of where you are, regardless of what you're doing, you can be born again tonight. And you can guarantee yourself a spot in that mansion we talked about. You can go to heaven when you die. Will you join me in prayer now? Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Lord, come into my life. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. We celebrate with you because we believe if you honestly prayed this story and prayed this prayer, believing this story, that you are now saved, you're born again. When you die, you'll go to heaven because we're all going to leave here one way or the other. And there may be others of you who struggle with sin like I do. I, like Paul, every time I look up, sin is present with me. In my mind, in my heart, I want to do what's right. But sin keeps calling my attention to what is wrong. I want to pray for us. That means pray for you and pray for me. That sin has no control, no dominion over our lives. Father God, we pray now for those of us who struggle with sin. Lord, we confess 
that we messed up. We confess that sin always bind us when we're not conscious of you. Lord, we ask you to forgive us. We ask you to bless us. We ask you to walk with us. God, we ask you to strengthen us and keep us. God, we ask you, Father God, to bless us in a way that we can always come to you and, and be delivered. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless every person that we will walk according to your will. Give us hope, give us strength. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. There may be a third group present with me tonight who, who doesn't have a church home or is in between church homes. I invite you to join, whether you are in Houston or outside of Houston, I invite you to join the New Beginning Church, a church that believes that Jesus is the Lord. We believe that God is God. Uh, will you join us? If you want to join us, join our church. If you want to, to be a part of our broadcast, you can join our church. Just inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part of this great church in Southeast Houston. But Jesus is the captain, but he's the center of attention. And he is the greatest testimony we will ever have. Inbox me and let me know that you want to join the church. We'd be glad to, to welcome you to the body of faith, this family of faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as we've explored the fact that salvation is available. And we are comfort one another with these words. It is now offering time. It is offering time. And it's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. You can give by two means if you're listening to this broadcast. You can give by way of Zelle, our Zelle account. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting dot Jesus at yahoo.com is our sale account. The idea here is as we lift Jesus, he will draw all men unto himself. Or you can mail in your offering or your tithes or your sacrificial gifts to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. As we close out in prayer tonight, we want to make sure we pray for Katie Smith. And the family of Aaron and, and Ann Williams, we want to lift them in prayer. We want to pray for Walter and, and Eloise, Eloise Johnson, Walter and Eloise Johnson. We want to pray for J.R. and Lula Richard. J.R. and Lula Richard, we want to lift them in prayer. We're praying for Ann Paul. We're praying for Ann Paul, and we're praying for the families that were affected by the condo collapse in Florida. Uh, what a nightmare, what a terrible, terrible thing that has taken place. So we want to lift those families in prayer. And we want to thank you and, and also ask for your prayers for on tomorrow, my bride and I celebrate 21 years of marriage. I'm gonna ask my bride to come over here. This is my bride. I want to thank God for my bride. Uh, she's still grinning, so I guess that means something. Uh, she's still grinning. I want to thank God for my bride of 21 years. The Lord spare us to live tomorrow. Uh, July 1st, 2021 will be 21 years. If I would ask her how many years we've been married, she'd start calculating. Well, this is 2021. We got married in 2000. So it's 21 years. So I want to thank her for being, <clears throat> being a jewel in my life, for being a great part of our ministry, for being a, a diligent in the fight for the Lord. And I want to thank her for, for just sticking with me for 21 years. <laughs> um, we got married right at one year after we met. We met in July 
of 1999, we were a we were a blind date, <laughs> and, and uh, I guess I'm still blind. <laughs> so we want to want to thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers, and so we want you to pray for us and keep us in your prayers as you walk through this this daily activity that we do. We want to thank the New Beginning Church for for just being a kind group of people, for your prayers, for your contributions, for your celebrations with us as we move forward. We thank you for your celebrations and your gifts toward my graduation. And I, I just want to thank you for, for just being kind. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We come lifting up Sister Katie Smith. Lord, we know that only you can heal. We know you know all things well. We ask you to bless and heal as only you can. Touch, Lord, as only you can. Move by way of your Holy Spirit as only you can. Lord, we pray for the family. We pray for Aaron and Ann Williams. We, we ask you, Father God, to, to bless them, to keep them. We pray, Father God, that you comfort them even in times like these. We, we pray, Lord, that you give them strength to look to you and to you alone. We pray for Walter and Eloise Johnson. We, we pray, Father God, that you continue to, to bless them and heal their bodies and, and strengthen them, that they will continue even in their season age. Lord, we pray for J.R. and Lula Richard. We, we ask you, Father God, to bless them. We ask you to keep them focused, keep them in your will. We ask you to heal their bodies, give them strength, give them hope, and bless them all to look to you, Father. Lord, we pray for the families of those who are affected, even in Florida right now. We pray, Father God, for lives to be saved, that people will know that you, God, can still keep them. We pray, Father God, that as they pull more from the rubble, that lives will appear. People will appear still alive, that you, God, will get the glory, and they will be a testimony for you. Lord, we pray for all these, Father God, whose names that we've called and those names that we do not know. We pray that you bless and keep them in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the New Beginning Church. We ask you to bless the New Beginning Church. We pray, Father God, for blessing us to walk in your will. Bless us to be concerned about soul winning, praising you, honoring you, and about the word of God. Lord, we thank you for this church. Now, Lord, we pray for churches all over the world, those who have set apart their time to honor you, Father God, that Jesus is King and Jesus is Lord. Lord, we thank you now. We ask you to dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, bless, Lord, that you will be received by us as majesty, dominion, glory, and power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We thank God for who he is and what he has already done. Thank you so much for joining us again tonight. If you're ever in Houston, come by and visit with us at our 1030 service. Uh, our 1030 service every Sunday every Sunday. Visit with us every Sunday at 1030. Our address is 4251 Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. Tune in for Sunday School and come and be a part of our Sunday School class every Sunday at 9 a.m. If you have children who are not in Sunday School, please inbox me and let me know because we want all children to be involved. Our children are participating in Bible study by way of Kahoot and uh, some are using the Sunday School books. In, uh, inbox me and let me know. And you don't have to be a member to participate in our Bible study nor our Sunday School class. We'll be glad to have you. Again, thank you so much. God bless you and God keep you. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, "In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.